Uh, so today we're going to talk about uh, a paper called Investigating the Multivariate Nature of NHL Player Performance with Structural Equation Modeling. Uh, so first we'll start off with a little outline of what we'll cover today. Um, we'll do a review of, you know, kind of the current state of hockey analytics and, you know, where it stands relative to some, some, other, some other sports and kind of what they're doing in the game of hockey. Uh, and then we'll look at some common and advanced statistics. We've talked a little bit about, um, or I guess a lot about this in this class. And, um, you know, we'll look over some of the common metrics that people use to evaluate NHL players. And then also some of the advanced statistics that have popped up over the past couple of years. Uh, and then we'll kind of dive into the paper um, and, and really talk about what the author does and um, his his method and structural equation modeling and then the results he gets and um, maybe some flaws that that we came up with about the paper. Uh, and then lastly, uh, we're going to talk about goalie evaluation because this is something that um, this paper lacks and a lot of other paper papers kind of, um, you know, can't really figure out what the best way to evaluate goalies is. So we're just kind of going to take a look at that. Um, so here, like I said, starting off with the current state of, you know, where hockey analytics are. Um, so they, they lag a lot behind other major sports, and this is probably mostly due to popularity. Um, if you look at, like, viewership, NHL lags behind, like, you know, basketball, baseball, um, soccer. So um, I guess a quick fact here, between 2012 and 2016, there, there were more basketball, soccer, and football papers that were published in this JQAS which is just the Journal of Quantitative Analysis in Sports. Um, baseball is omitted, om omitted from this, but they kind of have their own journal that um, a lot of their papers get published in. So um, I guess it's not really representative of, of how many baseball papers there are. Um, so then in hockey, obviously, we know there's a, there's a lot of things going on, much like basketball, uh, where a typical match can include over 400 play-by-play -play events, uh, which would correspond to something happening every, every nine seconds. Um, and then over in the past few years, there's been um, a move towards more uh, data that, that involves player tracking, um, and it's kind of really starting to catch wind. So now they've um, inputted chips inside the puck, um, also inside jerseys. So with that, you know, fans can see um, on one aspect, fans can see how fast like, a shot was, how long a shift was for a player. Um, but then on the other hand, coaches can really use this, um, these analytics to, you know, see how, how long uh, players were, were on the ice for a certain period of time during a game. Um, and you can measure a lot of, you know, different things with, 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 with these chips. Uh, no. Well, I get, do they? They're, well, they're, they're Fine. trying to be able to, like, I don't know if you've seen recently in Japan with baseball where they have the 3D yes. cameras. They're like doing research into right now they have um, like a defined number of camera angles in terms of seeing if the puck cross the goal line. Right. And so, yeah, they're trying to be able to give that like entire 3D orientation where you can like perfectly pinpoint yep. if the puck cross the line. I think they're trying that in soccer as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not sure how far they progress, but uh, yeah. yeah. Um, and then another thing they've, they've, they've done is they brought in this third party to kind of install a camera uh, in each arena, which can track um, more accurately, like where players are on the ice, like, you know, kind of plotting their X and Y coordinates um, on a map and, and with this you can you can get events that happen every 1.2 seconds just because of how detailed the 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 recognition software is so you know we'll, we'll talk a little bit so what what are i guess what are some common metrics that um you know you would use at least for people that know hockey pretty well that uh you would use to evaluate players it's going to be common or um like you know maybe some advanced statistics if you if you know of any of them Alex, it's a good one. Yeah. That's it. Points. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Plus minus. Yeah, and we'll talk a little bit about that. I just have one question about the, the chip in the puck. Is yeah. Being used to measure like how hard different players can hit it. Yeah. So a lot of times for the fans, you'll see when you watch a game, 
someone will wind up for a slap shot and it'll see like on the screen, like, oh, 85.7 miles an hour, um, which is like pretty cool. So like I said, there's one aspect for the fans that can get a more enjoyable viewing experience, but also for the players to use for their own analytics. Yep, it's obviously important. Um, so we didn't write all of them down, but um, these are obviously some very common ones, goals, assists, plus minus time on ice and face off one percentage. So we talked a little bit about plus minus and in basketball, it's obviously the game is hockey, but um, there are some major, major issues with it. So um, one, it has difficulty distinguishing between uh, line mates. So if you always play with the same player um, and, and you guys score while you're on the ice, everybody's um, plus minus jumps up by one, but that might not be indicative of the contributions that each player had for the goal. So in that sense, it's, it's a little bit skewed. Um, it also depends on ice time. So if a player is um, doubling uh, another player in, in time on ice over the course of the season, if they play consistent over the course of the season, their plus minus in either direction would be double what another player's would be. Um, and then just a, a little anecdote to, to show, you know, why, why it's, it's not a great statistic is in, in 2013, 2014, Alex Ovechkin, who's, um, like the leading goal scorer in the NHL for for forever, and he, he probably will be the best of all time, uh, passing Gretzky soon. But he scored 51 goals in 2013-14, but he had a plus minus of minus 35, which was good for third worst in the league. So 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 pretty awful. But the one thing that doesn't capture is power play and penalty kill goals aren't factored into your plus minus. So if you score on the power play, you don't add anything um, to your plus minus statistic, and that's where Alex Ovechkin is really the most valuable is 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 during the power play um so it's just kind of funny that he did score 51 goals contributed a lot to his team but his plus minus was one of the worst in the league um and then we obviously have a lot of advanced uh metrics we'll talk a lot more or a little bit more about these later um but the two that we won't talk about are goals versus threshold and player game score so I'll go over those um briefly now which uh, the goals versus threshold is just a metric that assigns a player value in goals above what a replacement player uh, would be. So kind of like a war statistic um, that you see in like baseball and some other sports. And then player game score is just a um, basically a formula um, that spits out um, or it's just like a linear combination of a bunch of predictive statistics that are weighted differently um, or that are assigned different weights. Um, and then Prater kind of, or Ethan will talk more about uh, some of the other metrics later on. Uh, so right now we have listed four defensemen. Um, I would say all of them are elite defensemen. And we're kind of just wondering, based on these statistics, we have listed which defensemen would you rather have and why based on just these raw performance metrics. Anybody has some ideas? These are defensemen, do they have a significant number of goals? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Especially Brent Burns. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that would be quite a bit for mm -hmm. uh, I mean, just looking at it, you know, he's got you know, 29 goals, which is more than double than anyone else. And his you know, block shots is lower but it's not all right but um just because he's not blocking the shot doesn't mean someone else isn't blocking the shot true yeah he's also playing um, the most virtual because you're getting quite a level for longer so i think it's another mm -hmm. well i mean the, the longer you play, that, that means hopefully, as you're saying, you, you don't have to go to a weaker person to your bench. Yeah. But then you have to deflate those numbers because they're from more time and look at the number of games. So that's why it's almost better to look at some of these numbers, you know, per minute or per 20 minutes or something like that. Yeah. So I, I don't necessarily think there's a definitive answer here. The reason we picked these four is because they have vastly different game styles. Um, to, to, to just compare two, 
Brent Burns, you obviously see the offensive production. He's heavily relied upon to be like contribute from the back end quarterbacks, the team's power play um, versus Jacob Slavin, who, I mean, I might be a little biased as more of a defensive minded player. He is arguably the best defensive defenseman in the league. He um, is like an anchor for one of the best defensive cores in the league. And his offensive metrics may not um, appear to be as strong, but consistently he plays a large amount of ice time against the best line of the other team and with the sole purpose of shutting them down. And so based on how you value offense versus defense, who you would like to have as a player may change. And part of the reason that we chose this paper is because it's going to evaluate how you weight, or it's going to weight offense versus defense in different manners. And that changes how players are evaluated. Um, and so here are just kind of a few of the advanced metrics that we're gonna define. And so uh, Corsi at its most basic level is just the number of shot attempts at even strength towards the opposition's net minus the shot attempts at even strength against your own net. And that include, when they define shot attempts, they include shots on goal, shots that miss the net and block shots. And so the Fenwick, it is measuring the exact same thing as Corsi however they choose to not count block shots. And so for Corsi, the overwhelming majority of statisticians use Corsi to indicate whether a team spends more time in the offensive zone versus the defensive zone. And this has been um, allowed Corsi to be kind of a proxy for puck possession. And so, um, we will see that later on in the paper as um, they use Corsi statistics to measure possession. And then Fenwick, the reason why shot blocks were removed is that they believe that Fenwick gives a stronger correlation to scoring chances. And then regression, regression adjusted plus minus. This statistic has um, been recently explored and has been used quite quite a lot. And so it's um, the use is to provide an estimate of each player's contribution to the team independent of the strength of his teammates, the strength of his opponents, and other variables that may not be in his control. And originally, least squares regression were used to give estimates. However, they had very large error bounds and um, a common issue is that certain pairs of players were often um, on the same line and that introduced collinearity. And that was one of the reasons for larger errors. Another reason was due to in hockey, there's the games are very low scoring, much different from basketball. And so in order to, when you have goals as events, there are not very many data points. And so in order to increase the number of data points and then reduce the air bounds, Corsi, Fenwick, and shots are considered events. And this um, provides a significantly more, um, more data. And so that's why regression adjusted plus minus has become a important statistic that is being used. All right, so we're going to start getting into the paper now, but before we do that, uh, we're going to go through one more example that kind of introduces why the authors choose to kind of look at what they did. So we have two players. These are their actual stat lines from the 2016-2017 season. Uh, as you can see, they're fairly similar or almost identical. Um, so I guess a question for the class, if you are an NHL GM, you have just these numbers, you know, you get to offer one player a contract, like who who would you offer the contract to? Obviously they're pretty similar, but player two. Yeah, I mean, one veteran plus minus, everything else is completely the same. So <laughs> player one is Vincent Trocheck, a player for the Florida Panthers. Player two is Dave Krejci, a player from the Boston Bruins. So 
This season, the Brewers were 44 and 31, and as a team, they were plus 22. The Panthers were 35 and 36, and as a team, they were minus 27. So, you know, we've talked about how it's important to look at what line you're on, what team you're on, right? To be minus 12 on a team that's plus 22 is actually pretty bad, while being plus or minus 13 on a team that's minus 27, it's not great, but it's much better. Um, so it's really important to, you know, look at these things when comparing players. Also, I purposely left this out, but they're both centers and Vincent Trocek had a face-off win percentage of 54% and Krejci had a face-off win percentage of 51%. So that's another statistic that would have been important to look at, but I left it out to make them look more similar. All right, so now we're going to talk about this research paper from 2017 that investigated the multivariate nature of NHL player performance with structural equation modeling. And the study's goal was to determine interrelations between offense, defense, and possession as understood through a constellation of measured vari variables um, represented of each of these components. And one of the reasons why we looked at this paper was because um, in sports, measuring a player's defensive ability is often much, much more challenging than measuring their offensive ability because you have statistics such as goals, assists, points that measure how they're contributing on the score sheet, but measuring like how they play defense and how important that is to the team is often much more challenging. And so in this paper, we're kind of going to try and see if they're able to do a, a good job of measuring how well maybe a third or fourth liner is able to contribute to a team so that a GM is able to, to say, okay, I want to choose this player as in the example um, that we just showed, I want to pay this player versus I don't want to pay this player. But first, we'll go into <clears throat> some measured statistics that um, the author kind of outlines in their paper. So as Ethan mentioned before, um, they use Corsi, uh, which is total number of shots that were on net, missed net, uh, but, and that were blocked on way to the net. Um, the author kind of breaks these down um, into different Corsi metrics, but also into different into different groupings. Um, so some of those are just Corsi for, which would be shots for, Corsi against, um, which would be shot attempts against. Uh, then you have Corsi 4%, so um, the amount of shots for over the total shots attempted in the game. Uh, then you break these down in in into these um, uh, these groupings. So you know, how many shots were attempted per 60 minutes, Corsi four per 60, and then similarly uh, against per 60. Um, another specific we look at is obviously goals. This is, this one's pretty explanatory. Um, so obviously a shot that goes past the goalie. So again, you can break the, they, he broke these down into different metrics and, and different groupings, um, goals, individual goals for a player, goals for a while on the ice, uh, against while on the ice and then again breaking these down into the time metrics um so how many um, goals for while on the ice you know per 60 against per 60 and then individual goals per 60. yeah okay so then we have assists um in hockey you can give out a maximum of two assists to, to two different players you are not required to give out assists um but um, the maximum that can be given out is two. There's a primary assist and a secondary assist. Uh, points is pretty self-explanatory. Goals plus assists. So. Um, have they done studies to see how the people who are giving assists are pretty consistent across games? But I assume each game has a different official score. People who decide whether or not there's an assist. Yeah, I don't know if that study has or like studies like that have been done, but just like based on experience, it's like they try it to get it right the best they can on the first time around, but then they like look back at the video and yeah. Um, and so a lot of these metrics that we have talked about for say Corsi have been on ice metrics. So when this respective player is on the ice and playing. We can also look at off ice metrics as simply the team's metrics when that player is on ice. Um, I believe we talked about this a little bit with basketball, 
But in order to uh, understand a player's worth with respect to the team, we can look at these off-ice metrics compared to on-ice metrics. And the author has, has defined these as relative to team metrics. And it's simply the on-ice metric minus the off-ice metric. And then finally, we have relative to line mate metrics. And so we kind of want to measure each player independent of who their line mates are. And so in order to do this, we have these relative to line mate metrics. And I'm not going to go through like the exact um, way that they, uh, like the equation that they set up, but it's the raw metric is just their, um, they take a weighted uh, average of how many line, like the line mates that they, all the line mates that they play with, how often they're playing with those line mates. And then they weight that in order to determine a individual statistic for just one single player. And um, then they, in order to do this, they can investigate each player's contribution independently of their line mates performance. And their assumption that they made was that if a player's line mates perform better when on a different line, then the player that they're interested in is on average worse than their line mates. So he is effectively hindering his line mates performance. And they don't take into account who's on the ice on the other not in this this so we're we're going to talk about some of the flaws later and um like that is one of the things that in these relative metrics they talk about it's independent of your teammates but it's not independent of who you're playing against yeah so going into kind of the modeling of how they use these statistics to get to the results that we'll go get to later so the three, uh, so yeah, they use structural equation modeling, which includes a latent variables and measured variables. Uh, the latent variables are what you're trying to calculate based on the measured variables. Uh, in this paper, the latent variables of interest are offense, defense, and possession. Um, obviously, offense and defense and possession are all kind of a little bit more abstract constructs. You can't really measure any of those variables by looking at just one statistic. Um, so what the authors do is they create a uh, a system of equations um, to represent these latent variables as uh, linear combinations of the measured variables that we do have. Right, so this is uh, getting a little bit more and deeper to the model they use, right? So they have offense, defense, and possession as the main statistics. Um, and like I said, you can't uh, measure any of these using one, right? I mean, like, the easiest thing would be to say, all right, we're going to measure offense in terms of points. Um, I think that nobody can argue that right now, Connor McDavid is the best offensive player in the NHL. He's 151 points in 80 games. No one's had 150 points since 1996. Um, right. But the second leader in points is Leon Dreisaitl, who has 124 points. Third is Nikita Kucherov, who has 111 points. So is Leon Dreisaitl really the second best offensive player in the NHL, or is he just benefiting from playing with Connor McDavid? Um, you know, similarly, David Pasternak has 60 goals this year, but he's playing on the best line in hockey right now. Do we really think he's, you know, the second best goal scorer in the NHL? Potentially, you know, would you rather have a guy like Nathan McKinnon, who has 108 points, or Matthew Kachuk, who has 100, or no, McKinnon has 107. Uh, Kachuk has, 108 playing on the Panthers and he's their leading scorer by like 30 points. So, um, right. So in order to get that, they take, uh, the statistics of interest and then also look at the team weighted and the line mate weighted. So for possession, as we talked about earlier, uh, the proxy for that is Corsi, the shots attempt for first shot against four. Um, I mean, it's definitely not a perfect measure of possession because it, just completely negates defensive zone possession or like neutral zone possession. But I mean, it is still, even though it's not perfectly possession, it is a useful statistic in terms of when you're looking at how good a player is, you want like you want your team to be in the offensive zone when your best players are on the ice. So that does actually get at that. Uh, offense, they look at points and goals. 
And then they do the goals weighted to their team and their line mates. Defense, it's just goals against while they're on the ice. And these are all per 60 minutes. Um, and then again, weighted to the team, weighted to the line mate. And then they use this second more complicated model that didn't end up working as well. So the results are all based on that first model, but I'll talk about it a little bit. Offensive face zone percent, face off percentage, OZFO, is the percentage of face offs that occur in the offensive zone. Defense is the opposite. And then they also add an assist to the offense statistics. Um, so the author didn't really give a great reason as to why offensive zone for offensive zone face off percentage is in the possession category. He just said that it created a better fit model when it was there instead of the offense. Um, I mean, just like intuitively, if your team, if you have an offensive zone face off, that's similar to what Corsi measures of just being in the offensive zone. However, that's the issue that face offs are heavily determined by what the line before you does because of line changes. So, you know, that could be a big part of the reason that it wasn't as good of a model. And then defense. Uh, the author said it was between there and possession, and he put it in defense. Uh, I think one possible explanation for that was he gave was icings. So if you ice the puck, you get a defensive zone face off and you can't change. Uh, and he said that that led to lots of goals against. Um, so it actually benefited from putting that in defense. And then these little purple circles right here are what uh, he called disturbances. Um, so that's just uh, what it's supposed to measure is the um, the other predictors that could possibly be going to these that aren't specified under our measured variables. Um, one example he gave that an offensive disturbance could be a player's shooting percentage or just general offensive skill. And it's okay that that's not measured because that's not going to affect defense or possession. Similarly, he gave a possible disturbance uh, for defense as goalie skill which again, that would deflect defense, but not possession or offense. Um, and we talk about how taking out goalies is a big flaw of this paper. Like he acknowledges that it's a disturbance, but he does not weight the player's goals against to their goalie skill. Um, and then finally, there's links between the three. So there's an error going from possession to defense and possession to offense because it's um, if you have possession of the puck more often, you're going to score more goals and more goals are getting scored when you're on the ice and you're gonna be in the offensive zone. So there's gonna be less goals against. Then there's this link, which is um, offense to defense. This one we found a little bit problematic. The author states here, he's making an assumption that uh, if a player has high offensive production, that's gonna hinder their defense because they're gonna miss coverage because of overemphasis on offense. And, that is certainly true for some players, but to make that as an overarching assumption is not great. Like, there are definitely players for which that's true. Like Alex Ovechkin is going to be spending most of his energy in the offensive zone. They, they might get more goals scored against while he's out there. But to make that for every player um, is not great. So that's one of the flaws. But using this model, he came up with these results. And just looking at these, like, I don't know if I would trust these as my rankings of the top 20 players in all these categories. But it is interesting to see, um, you know, who's not on these lists. And then also some players that are do appear on these lists that you might not have expected. And like I said, I don't know if I would just go blind faith and trust this, but it is really interesting to see, you know, if you could try to make this better, it would be really helpful for GMs to be say able to say, oh, Connor Sheary is the second best offense player in the NHL. I don't know if that's true, but uh, it could help you find severely uh, undervalued players. One of the big issues we saw was in this defensive category. We look at the best defensive player in the NHL. It's Anton Slepyshev, who I didn't know that name until I read this paper. I looked up his stats. He was on the Edmonton Oilers that year. He was a fourth line player. Um, you know, the Oilers made the playoffs. He played in all the playoff games, but he's been an NHL, AHL player, you know, his whole career. And two years after this, uh, he switched over to the KHL, which is the Russian professional league. And he has been there since. So 
do we really believe that the best defensive player in the NHL was in the KHL two years later? Probably not. Yeah. Oh, that's what I was going to say too. What's your question? I was just wondering, looking at these, especially for the defensive, and I guess it makes sense for offensive, but why are there just more forwards in the top one than defensemen? Yeah. So and one thing. Yeah. <laughs> one thing that we did notice is that this heavily, uh, it's like this seems to uh, benefit players that have less time on ice. I'm almost sure they used goals. Yeah, they use goals against per 60. However, right, if you look at Shea Weber, he's playing 1,400 minutes, and he's going to be playing against the other team's best players for a lot of those minutes, whereas Anton Slepeshev, he's a fourth liner playing 500 minutes. He's going to be going against the other team's fourth line basically every time he's out there. So that's going to cause – some big discrepancies that I don't know if we should trust. And that, you know, is a big flaw in this. Is that, what's your question? I was just going to ask, they didn't control for where, like if you're, if you take X number of faceoffs, they didn't control for the distribution of where you're taking it, right? It's like a lot, you're not putting a fourth line out in the D zone as much as to a quick, like if you're. Top yeah, I don't think they control for any of that. And like I said, they, they're using this is the results based on the first model, which doesn't include faceoffs at all. Um, yeah, but yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean that is a big flaw with this paper is that it's penalizing players for being on good lines. But part of being on a good line is that you're going to be playing against the other team's best players, basically every time you're out there. So. It's definitely an issue. So then you wanted to turn these into overall uh, scores to find the best overall players in the NHL. You did that in two ways. The first is this like even weighting, possession divided by 10 plus offense minus defense. And then the second, what he called offensive, um, I forget what it's called, like just offensive focused and two times offense, half times defense. So these were completely up to the author. Um, you know, I don't know if those are the weightings that we want to go with. I guess that's a question for the class is, you know, how would you weight these different statistics when trying to find out how good a player is overall? What would be the optimal? My first comment is never see nice integers and out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely the case, yeah. I mean, I've never really watched hockey, but my guess is you'd probably want defense to be more weighted. Just like I think about basketball, you're being regularly in the 130s and 40s. So, like, mm -hmm. good offense will tend to be good defense. But, like, if a hockey game, you only have two or three goals, like, you might need that defender in that one play way more than any one play in basketball. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, that's definitely true. I think the offensive, uh, weighted one kind of gets at more of the all-stars of the NHL, um, which is an interesting thing. But these are, are the top 20 players overall, and then this is the offensive focus. Um, but looking at this, it's a little bit less ridiculous than the last one. Like, these are actually some of the best players in the NHL. Um, Connor McDavid's the best player when you look at offense focus. Uh, and, you know, Matthew Chuck, high up on offense, but – Watching the NHL, he's a great two-way forward, so it kind of makes sense that he'd be up there. But again, we see a lot less defensemen on this list, um, especially when looking at offense focused. <clears throat> so, going back to the discussion, do you really need a way to have the exchange rate between goals scored and goals prevented? Mm -hmm. And I know in some sports, you need that aggregating expectation, which you were supposed to be able to go to Graham Clark or watch my video. We are looking at your team's points scored and points allowed, and you can see how much of an advantage is it for you in your winning percentage to score one more point versus prevent one more point from being scored against. You. Yeah. And so that could be some way to try to, but it's going to be relative to your entire team. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So going back to the player comparison I did earlier, we talked about how once you incorporate everything, Trochak's probably a better player. He got an offensive score of 0.23, whereas Krejci got an offensive score of 0.11, which kind of matches up with what we would expect. Yeah, so we, we just wanted to kind of return back to this comparison of these defensemen and 
kind of if if you look at the so the the U is the unweighted and the W is the weighted towards like offense production. And so um, Jacob Slavin is not even listed in the top 20 based on the weighted. However, he scores very, very highly based on the unweighted. And so um, we just kind of wanted to make the point that if you value defense equally, you may even value it more than, than offense, um, what a player is contributing like in a defensive manner may make their worth uh, much, much higher than they actually appear to be worth just based on their, you know, raw performance metrics of points, um, stuff like that, so. All right, so I don't know if you guys noticed when I showed the top 20 offensive players, but neither Patrick Kane or Sidney Crosby was in the top 20. Uh, that's pretty problematic. They were the second and third leading goal scorers in the NHL that year. Right, but, you know, as we talked about earlier, this is putting a large emphasis on who are they playing with, who else is on their team. So that year, it was 2016-17, Patrick Kane was playing on a team with, or on a line with Artemi Perrin. Uh, they had great chemistry, right? But then that hinders Patrick Kane's scores because, you know, he's got a line mate that's scoring almost as many goals as him, almost as many assists as him. Um, so it brings up a question of would he be putting up those same numbers on a different team, on a different line? Um, and then obviously Crosby plays on the same team with Evgeny Malkin, um, which is the same kind of deal. They don't actually, I don't think Crosby and Malkin usually play together, but being on the same team hurt Sidney Crosby in this case. And I think this is not a case of oh, this is a good reason that they didn't show up in the top 20. I think this is, you know, just shows one of the flaws of the paper, uh, but, you know, tries to give a possible explanation for it. Another case study I talked about, uh, I talked about how this, if you did it correctly, could be very useful for, for trying to find undervalued players, uh, you know, figuring out who do we want to sign. The second offensive player was Connor Sheary, who... Production-wise, had a pretty good year, 53 points in 61 games, uh, plus 24. Um, you know, probably not playing on Pittsburgh's top line most of the time, um, but, you know, ended up being a key contributor to their team, and Pittsburgh ended up winning the Stanley Cup that year. Uh, you know, if you're just looking at stats and you're looking through the point leaders, you're not going to say that Connor Shearer was a big reason the Pittsburgh Penguins won the Cup, but, you know, clearly a very valuable member of their team. Yeah, so we've talked about a little bit of these flaws already. Um, you know, we talked about how the weighting might be putting too much emphasis on offense, might be underweighting defense. Um, do you want to talk about chemistry? Yeah, um, just one of the examples of um, like when you rate the uh, players relative to their line mates, an example that comes into play, Daniel and Henrik Sabine, their brothers, they, um, I mean, they're brothers, they have just an unmatched chemistry that you can't account for. However, under these metrics, they were severely undervalued because of their um, poor play with their teammates. And that would, that would suggest that they are not as good as players as they actually are. However, they were, um, they were the driving force behind Vancouver to be a very, very good team this year. And so we don't see them in these metrics as top overall players. However, they were some of the, I would argue, top 20 players in the league because when they play together, their um, chemistry is just unmatched and their ability to make plays cannot be like accounted for just based on these statistics. Yeah. So then uh, we've talked about this a little bit, but it might be overemphasizing uh, the weighting in terms of you know how they perform compared to their line mates or teammates um you know because it's penalizing them for being on a good line but not benefiting them for playing against good lines another thing is it fails to incorporate players roles on their lines should we be penalizing dry sidle for playing with Connor mcdavid probably but should we be penalizing Connor mcdavid for playing with dry sidle that's a little bit more of an open question because 
he's really creating a lot more of that offense and dry is the one benefiting from it. Just like watching that. Um, and then the assumptions that the model makes, uh, the one that we found most problematic, I talked a little bit about in the model, but the assumption that for every player in the NHL, high offensive production leads to less emphasis on defense uh, is not really a great assumption to make. Yeah. And then a couple other flaws um, is that like a player's defensive numbers can rely heavily like on their goalie. If you have a goalie like Andre Vasilevsky, who's considered, you know, the, the best in the world, give him, you know, backstop and your own end, um, you know, that could be a big factor in why you're not giving up a lot of goals. And, and this, uh, this model doesn't really account for that. The model does not look at shots allowed. It does, but that goes into possession. And then um, uh, we'll talk about, you know, how to evaluate goalies in a little bit, but this paper, um, you know, doesn't look at uh, goalies, goalies really at all. Um, not, but obviously they can be a really big contributor to your team. Um, yeah, so now, now we we're going to talk about goalies. So um, can anybody think of some maybe statistics on how to evaluate goalies? Yeah. yeah. So we have safe percentage, goals against average, shutouts and wins. Shutouts and wins are pretty self-explanatory. Um, save percentage is just the number of total shots on goal that a goaltender stops divided by the total number of shots on goal. Goals against average is the number of goals allowed per 60 minutes of playing time. Um, so those are the mainstream statistics. Can you think of anything that may be wrong with just using those statistics? Um, like what do they not account for? Yeah. No, I'll, I'll take the easy one with wins. Mm -hmm. That doesn't account for who you're playing with. Yeah. Or who you're playing against. Yeah. 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 It'd be something with difficulty of shots. Like, <clears throat> is this guy really good at super close up shots? Or is he like let super far ones away? Kind of mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, um, here's just an example that we have um, from 2018 19, Andre Vasilevsky. Um, What's not mentioned, like obviously he has better statistics in every single category. It appears like he's by far the better goalie. What is not mentioned is that this year, Tampa Bay Lightning had like historically one of the greatest seasons up until this year when Boston kind of eclipsed them, but they won six. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, they won 62 games. They won the President's Trophy. They led in virtually all offensive and defensive categories. Whereas John Gibson finished, uh, played for Anaheim, they finished third to last and their team had a minus 52 goal differential. And so um, like some of you mentioned, these statistics do not take into account like how good the team is that they're playing for and the quality of shots that their team is giving up that they need to make saves on. Um, so now we'll kind of go into a way to evaluate goalies. Um, Alex mentioned this before. It's just goals saved above expected. And it's a metric that's kind of been popping up uh, more recently when, when, when talking about goalies. So um, I'll go through a quick example of how to calculate it. So uh, first, we'll take the expected goals, which is just the percent chance that a shot goes in, given a number of factors like the distance, the shot angle, goalie positioning, uh, defensemen that were there, uh, you know, whether or not it was like a cross crease pass, which would be a, a tough save for a goalie. Um, and then you take the sum of all of these percentages for each shot. So, for example, if Sidney Crosby shoots three shots in the game, one's at 15% chance of going in, one's at 10% chance of going in, and one's at a 30% chance of going in, you um, sum those all those up and the expected goals uh, would be uh, – 0.55 um, and then so you total all these up for each player in the game um, so then you get expected goals for the game and then you just take um, the number of goals uh, or the expected goals in the game and subtract the total goals that a goalie gave up so if the expected goals is like 2.5 and a goalie gave up three goals 
uh, his GSAX for the game would just be negative 0.5. And obviously goalies want this number to be positive. Um, and just kind of revisiting um, this last example, clearly we can see that there's a um, you know major difference in the GSAX for Gibson over Vasilevsky. He almost four times his number. And um, it kind of makes you think about you know, uh, um, how to evaluate goalies. And so Andre Vasilevsky won the Vesna Trophy that year. And um, it makes you think about well, how much of that season was contributed to, um, you know, his team, the quality of his team versus John Gibson, who was on a much worse team. But clearly he had more of an impact on his team, according to the GSAX metrics, than Andre Vasilevsky um, did. So it's just kind of interesting to think about um, how to evaluate, you know, players for these awards that, that, that are given out. Another cool thing about the GSAX, um, statistic is you can look at the quality of a shutout. So if you, so for a shutout, your goals against and your save percentage will be the same. You have a thousand save percentage and your goals against will be zero. Right. But with the, with the goals saved above expected metric, you can actually see how good of the quality of the shutout. Was it a, uh, was a shutout like 3.5 goals saved above expected, or was it just one? You know, obviously the 3.5 is a lot better. So um, we just kind of wanted to finish off with this example because we thought, um, you know, it's a metric that we've seen popping up recently for goalies, but the paper kind of fails to address. And and with that, kind of wraps up our presentation. So especially when so much of sports analytics, at least in the common person's view, is just what you see with your eyes. Mm -hmm. You just see, oh, the goalie made a save. Well, yes, but was it an easy shot to save? Yeah. You know, are you, as defenders, are you forcing people to take low probability shots? Mm -hmm. In which case, then you'll, you'll have a much easier shot. Are you seeing this reflected in contact scenarios? Are you seeing, you know, if you look at what people were getting 10, 15 years ago, are the contracts more influenced by the older metrics and now you see? I think, yeah, I, I think, I think more so. I mean, I, I don't know about Gibson contract, but I'm assuming he's, he's one of the higher paid players on his team. Vasquez, he, he's still a fantastic. Well, he's probably the best now, but during the season it was different, but um, like he gets paid a lot. There's, um, I don't know. I've, I've been seeing it a lot more pop up. So I'm assuming, you know, coaches, GMs are kind of factoring it in to like how, how, how good their goalies are and um yeah it's just kind of interesting to to follow and see like oh how what are the quality of shots that this goalie faces and stuff like that so, that's it yeah, yeah that's good